The truth is announced to creation by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. Here, when the consciousness rises above, quote, the double bound of space and time, and enters into eternity, here at this moment of annunciation, the one who announces the truth and the truth announced coincide completely. In the appearance of the spirit of truth, i.e. in the light of Tabor, the form and the content of the truth are one. But perceived and assimilated by creation, the knowledge of truth falls into time and into space, into the time of the diversity of the individual and into the space of the diversity of the social. This doubly breaks the immediate unity of form and content and knowledge of the truth becomes knowledge, knowledge about the truth. Truth and knowledge about the truth is truth. It is indisputable that truth necessarily exists alongside the truth if creation exists alongside God. The existence of truth is only another expression of the very fact of the existence of creation as such, i.e. as existing as an individual diversity in time and as a social diversity in space. The presence of truth is equal to the presence of creation. But does creation itself exist? This starts, um, thus starts letter six uh, on contradiction from Pavel Florensky's The Pillar and the Ground of the Truth. Um, and I'm going to read a little bit. This is a rather long chapter, and Florensky being a brilliant, brilliant mathematician, he brings in symbolic logic here to explore the, uh, the, at the heart of the, the Christian mystery is, is antinomy. Um, and the truth is found veiled, but is found in, in the sitting with, in the embracing of antinomy. He uses, um, so symbolic logic here, I'll see if I can show you, to explore the idea of the thesis and the antithesis and the relation between the two in terms of discerning the truth in the creative world. So the truth is an antinomy, a contradiction in creation, but it is not in, in heaven. So I'll show you what that looks like. So it goes into arguments here, as you can see, and I'm going to see if I can, you know, uh, summarize them. So, uh, you know, we have the thesis, which is the assertion, and then it's negation. And in the relationship between the assertion and the negation, there's some form of synthesis, there's some form of creative act or disclosive act that is found, but it is found through a contradiction. And that contradiction is inherent in the symbolic logic of the thesis and the antithesis because each infers the other. So he says on the thesis side, which he marked as P here, and um, Q would be the antithesis side. So in a summary, he says, what well, one can suppose either the thesis P or its negation, the antithesis, which is negative P. In the first case, sorry about that. So in the first case, there is no need to prove the thesis. While in the second case, the antithesis, the negation of the thesis, it turns out that from the antithesis, one can once again derive the thesis so that the following alternative is obtained, quote, either the thesis or the thesis. Right? This is the contradiction. This is, this isn't supposed to, this is supposed to, he says later on, uh, disturbed the, the rational mind, right? It's supposed to uh, cause a um, kind of a skip to happen in a sense. And that's where the, the fruit of this uh, labor is, it's in a sense. So that's the thesis, right? So on the antithesis side, one can suppose either the antithesis, negative P, or it's a negation, the anti-antithesis, negative, negative P, i.e. the thesis P. In the first case, there is no need to prove the antithesis, while in the second case, it turns out that from the thesis, one can once again derive the antithesis so that the following alternative is obtained, either the antithesis or the antithesis, right? So on the thesis side, what was obtained, either the thesis or the thesis, and on the antithesis side, we have either the antithesis or the antithesis. Uh, so we're going to skip. Um, this will become more clear in, in its application here later on. Um, and he brings uh, his exploration of antinomy, of contradiction, as such in its origin in the Greek, uh, early Greek antiquity. Um, 
And that's where I'm going to pick up here uh, and start reading. Um, and I guess it will make more sense as we get later on, but don't look for a resolution of uh, some contradiction that you have thinking that it's going to be resolved here or that, that is, that's even the goal. So he says, quote, upon what is the superiority of the Greek mind based? Asks one historian of Greek thought. Quote, the secret is its astonishing success, he answers, consists in a combination of opposites. An extraordinary riches of creative fantasy along with an ever vigilant doubt, inquisitive and daring everything. A powerful ability to make generalizations combined with acute powers of ob observation, exploring all the peculiarities of a phenomenon, a religion that fully satisfies psychic needs without placing fetters on the mind that analyzes its creations. To this must be added a diversity of competing spiritual centers, a constant collision of forces excluding the possibility of stagnation, and finally, a governmental organization and social structure sufficiently severe to restrain, quote, the wayward childish urges of the reckless and sufficiently free not to hinder the bold impulses of exceptional minds. In this combination of gifts and circumstances, one can perceive the source of the dominant success achieved by the Greek spirit in the domain of scientific study. How did the living perception of antinomy begin? And here he goes into uh, more of the origins of this idea of the antinomy, but I'm going to skip a little bit further. All right, so the idea here is that uh, the Greek, Greek antiquity and its wrestling with antinomy, with contradiction, specifically in, in Heraclitus, which you know, was explored thoroughly by German idealism. That is kind of the root question of uh, German idealism in terms of what is the relationship between the one and the all and the all and the one. Of course, Heraclitus has a famous quote um, talking about and exploring this uh, exact idea. Heidegger, Holderin, Hegel, they all were influenced around the same time, generally, uh, about this question. And this question ultimately comes down to the question of being. Um, so we're going to fast forward a little bit here and I'm going to read and uh, do kind of a close reading. I found myself, you know, circling and highlighting almost every page after this. So I'm hoping that it makes uh, more sense in terms of what we're looking at here. He says, knowledge of contradiction and love of contradiction, along with, an along with ancient skepticism, appear to be the highest achievement of antiquity. So knowledge of contradiction and love of contradiction, along with ancient skepticism, are the highest achievements of antiquity, according to Florensky here. We must not, we dare not, cover contradiction over with the paste of our philosophemes. And he has an exclamation point there. Let contradiction remain as profound as it is. If the noble world is cracked, and if, it, and if in practice we cannot repair its cracks, Neither must we hide them. I mean, here's, this is a deep psychoanalytic, uh, you know, um, concept right here. All right. This crack in our psyche that we attempt to cover over with the signifier, with the image, with the idol. Um, Florensky here is, you know, saying that that is kind of the root cause of the, the nihilism that, and the, uh, that we find ourselves in. Remember, he was writing in the early uh, 20th century. He says, if the knowing reason is fragmented, if it is not a monolithic slab, if it is self-contradictory, again, we must not pretend that it is not the case. It's like the fission between the conscious and the unconscious. The impotent exertion of human rationality to reconcile contradictions should have been repulsed long ago by a bold acceptance of contradictoriousness. The book of Job, he writes, wholly consists of such a concentrated experience of contradiction. This book is wholly constructed on the idea of antinomicalness. Here, God, quote, reminds us that man is not the measure of creation, that the universe is designed according to a plan which infinitely surpasses human reason. The desires and works of God are essentially incomprehensible to man and therefore appear to him unreasonable. Quote, we cannot find him out. He respecteth not any that are wise of heart. 
Everything is a mystery, says one of Dostoevsky's characters. Quote, God's mystery is in everything. The heart feels frightened and amazed, and this fright gives joy to the heart. It is even more beautiful that it is a mystery. Close quote. I think that's such an important idea to wrestle with, is the acceptance of the mystery uh, and not in a... Um, in a genuine way. I don't know if I can put words to it, obviously. Um, so continuing on, the mystery of moral disorder amazes Job with its magnificence, but his friends do not even notice it. Lay your hand upon your mouth. This is a gesture of silence and mystery, the very same gesture with which John the seer of mysteries is often painted on icons. Continuing on, the mysteries of religion are not secrets that one must not reveal. They are not the passwords of conspirators, but inexpressible, unutterable, indescribable experiences, and he has experiences here uh, italicized, which cannot be put into words except in the form of contradictions, which are yes and no at the same time. They are mysteries that transcend meaning. That is why when it is expressed in church hymns, the rapture of the soul is inevitably enveloped in the shell of a distinctive play of concepts. The whole liturgy, especially the canons and stichra, is full of this ceaselessly exuberant wit of antithetic juxtapositions and antinomic affirmations. Interesting note here is that, uh, you know, I think postmodernism attempted to wrestle with this um, but do it solely on its own terms, in terms of human rationality and logic. Um, and that's what's uh, led to kind of the results of, that we, we, the fruits that we are seeing um, being developed and, and bared in, uh, in the 20, 2020s here. He continues, Contradiction. It is always a mystery of the soul, a mystery of prayer, and love. The closer one is to God, the more distinct are the contradictions. The heavenly Jerusalem, in heavenly Jerusalem, there are no contradictions. Here on earth, there are contradictions in everything, and they can be removed either by social reorganization or they cannot be removed by social reorganization nor by philosophical argument. So no revolution and no thinking through the contradictions. From our human perspective, at least. Something great, long desired, but wholly unexpected. The great unexpected joy will come suddenly. It will embrace, it will embrace and shake the entire sphere of earthly being. It will roll the heavens up like a scroll, wash the earth, give new powers, renew everything, transubstantiate everything, and show the most simple and everyday things is an all abiding, all blinding radiance of effulgent beauty. Then there will be no contradictions and no rationality tormented by contradictions. But now the brighter is the truth of the tri radiant light shown by Christ and reflected in the righteous the light in which the contradiction of the present age is overcome by love and glory. The blacker will be the cracks of the world, cracks in everything. But I wish to speak of cracks in the domain of speculation. In heaven, there is only the one truth. But here on earth, we have a multitude of truths, fragments of the truth, non-congruent to one another. In the history of the shallow and boring thought of, quote, modern philosophy, Kant had the boldness to utter the great word antinomy, which violated the decorum of the apparent unity. For this alone, he would have melted, he would have merited eternal glory. It does not matter if his own antinomies are unsuccessful. What is important is the experience of antinomicalness. Well, I don't, I don't want to make this video too long. I'm going to try to get it at 20 minutes. Um, so next paragraph here. Uh, from the point of view of dogmatics, antinomies are inevitable. If sin exists, and the first half of faith is the recognition that it does in fact exist, then our entire being, just like the world, whole world is fragmented. 
Taking as our starting point one corner of the world or our own rational mind, we have no reason to expect that we will get the same results we would have gotten if we had started from another corner. A meeting is improbable. The existence of a multitude of dissonant schemes and theories, which are equally conscientious, but proceed from different starting points, is the best proof that there are cracks in the world. Reason itself is fragmented and split, and only the purified God-bearing mind of saintly ascetics is somewhat more whole. In this mind, the healing of the fissures and cracks has began, has begun. The sickness of being is being cured. The wounds of the world are being healed. For this mind itself is the healing organ of the world. So we're saying that the, the saint is making some headway, somewhat, in healing this fissure and in, in his or herself and the world. And he says, this mind, this proclivity, this comportment of understanding sin in terms of faith, um, you know, if we don't have this primordial understanding of sin as an inherent contradiction and crack in the mind, we start building edifices, societies, organizations that inherently exacerbate the sin by trying to cover it over. And that leads to collective disaster, as we've seen throughout uh, Scripture, to say the least. And this mind, this mind of the saint, uh, the sickness is being is beginning to be cured. The wounds of the world are being are being healed. For this mind itself is the healing organ of the world. I'm going to skip some more. He goes into uh, Socrates and Plato. And here he has uh, my notes, the necessity of the heresy of rationality. So I'm skipping forward here. A heresy, even a mystical one, is a rational one-sidedness that claims to be everything. The Greek word arisis means choice, tendency, a disposition to something. Then it means what is chosen, a chosen mode of thought, and finally, a party, sect, or philosophical school. This idea contains the, the this word contains the idea of one-sidedness, of some sort of rectilinear concentration on one of many possible affirmations. Orthodoxy has a universal nature, but heresy essentially has a sectarian nature. The spirit of the sect is the egoism that emanates from it, spiritual separateness. A one-sided proposition takes the place of the absolute truth, and such a proposition that excludes everything in which is seen antinomic complement to the given half of the antinomy rationally incomprehensible. An object of religion, in falling from the heaven of spiritual experience into the fleshliness of rationality, inevitably spits, splits apart into aspects that include one another. And I've underlined this part here. The task of an orthodox, universal rationality is to collect all the fragments, their fullness, while the task of a heretical sectarian rationality is to choose the fragments that pleases one. Quote, you need many strings to play on the psaltery of eternity. Let's see how much I can get in here. Okay, so I'm going to continue here. As we have said, for rationality, fullness in unity or integral fullness is only postulated. But the con condition of the intuitive givenness of a postulate is the taming of one's rational activity and the going out into thinking, into the thinking of the, the full grace of restored purified, and recreated human nature. Christ gave the seed of the new creation, quote, the seed of God, and the fixed point of the immovable rock on which we can stand, saving ourselves from epochy, which is kind of this skepticism, this doubt. But connected fullness is only a hope. It will be, it will be given only to the one who will wash all the filth from creation by the Holy Spirit. Dogmas are comprehended by the Spirit, in whom is the fullness of understanding. But, for the time being, the more profound and fuller is the experience, the more acute and diverse will the antinomies of faith be. Indeed, the Holy Scripture is full of antinomies. Not only do the judgments of different biblical authors, justification by faith in the Apostle Paul and justification by works in the Apostle James and so on, intersect antinomically, but this is even the case for the same author, not only in different writings, but even in the same writing, not only in different passages, but even in the same passage. Antinomies stand side by side, sometimes in a single verse. They are found in the most powerful passages where they shake the soul of the believer like the rushing wind and strike the high places of the mind like lightning. 
Only genuine religious experience apprehends antinomies and sees how their reconciliation is possible. But for positivistic rationality, they are not visible or their paradoxic paradoxality appears to be the literary manner of, the, of a sick mind. Consider the Apostle Paul. His brilliant religious dialectic consists of a series of discontinuities. It jumps from one affirmation to another where each successive affirmation is antinomic with respect to the preceding one. Sometimes an antinomy is even embodied in a stylistic discontinuity of exposition in an, ex in an external asymptote. I don't know what that word means. A-S-Y-N-D-E-T-O-N. Rationally, contradictory and mutually exclusive judgments have their sharp edges directed against each other. Now, skip forward here. Antinomies are the constituent elements of religion. If we conceive it rationally, thesis and antithesis as warp and woof bind the very fabric of religious experience. Where there, are so, where there is no antinomy, there is no faith. But this will only be when faith and hope vanish away and only love remains. How cold and distant, how godless and stale seems to me now that, that time of my life when I considered the antinomies of religion resolvable but not yet resolved. When in my proud madness I affirmed the logical monism of religion. Got to remember that Pavel Florensky is a brilliant abstract mathematician published uh you know so it's very interesting that the path that he took to come to these conclusions uh, in a sense or these observations continuing self-renunciation is the only thing that brings us close to godlikeness godlikeness self-renunciation is the only thing that brings us close to godlikeness but both self-renunciation in general and self-renunciation of rationality in particular are an absurdity for rationality a cannot be not A, impossible, but certain. From I, love makes not I, for true love lies in the rejection of rationality. I have spoken enough about antinomies in general. Let me present several con concrete examples from an uncountable multitude. So we're going to get into biblical passages that um, manifest this antinomic structure. Paul's antinomies are the first to strike the eyes, and for a very simple reason. In Paul, the profundity of theosophical speculations is combined with a dialectical form, whereas in other sacred writers, the form is somewhat aphoristic, or on the other hand, other hand systematic. I circled this here. The rational mind is not predisposed to accept connectedness here, and therefore it does not at once notice the contradictions behind the aphoristic disjointedness. So he's he's giving advice how to encounter these antinomies because it's not a uh, natural quality of the rational mind. Uh, but a dialectical ex exposition predisposes the rational mind to expect connectedness. And when the connectedness is disrupted by a salient point, quite quote unquote salient point, at which thesis and antithesis converge, the rational mind involuntarily shudders. This clearly means that it is required to sacrifice itself. This is, uh, reflects back to me the, uh, quote, crucify the intellect. For us, the most appropriate epistle is the most dialectical and fiery one, namely Romans, this antinomy-charged, bursting bomb against the rational mind. Here, by way of example, is a table of antinomies chosen in a rather haphazard fashion. I deliberately exclude certain antinomies that I intend to examine in a future book. And here we'll go through a few of these, these passages. Thesis, consubstantial, antithesis, trihypostatic. Two natures are united in Christ. Thesis, as, un, as unmerged and unchanging. Antithesis, as indivisible and inseparable. Relation of man to God. Thesis, predestination, Romans 9, where the rejection of Israel is explained from the objective and theological point of view, i.e. the economic point of view, i.e. an answer is given to the question, quote, for what reason? Antithesis, free will, Romans 9, 30 to 10, 21, where the rejection of Israel is explained from the moral and anthropological point of view, i.e., from the hamartiological point of view, an answer is given to the question, why? On sin, thesis, through the fall of Adam, i.e., as a chance phenomenon in the flesh, Romans 5. 
antithesis, through the finitude of the flesh, i.e. A, uh, a necessarily inherent in it, as necessarily inherent in it. Judgment on judgment thesis, Christ as the judge of all Christians during his second coming. Antithesis, God is finally judging all people through Christ. Retribution. Thesis, retribution applied to all according to their works. Antithesis, free forgiveness of the redeemed. It's a very uh, popular one to think about. Final fate. Thesis, universal restoration and bliss. Antithesis, the double end, perdition. Deserts. Thesis, the necessity of the works of asceticism. Antithesis, the lack of necessity of works of asceticism. Romans 9.16, quote, So then it, mercy, is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. More thesis, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Antithesis, for it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his pleasure. Thesis, the soul of the Lord desired freely, but it desired freely that which, antithesis, it should have desired according to the will of his father, from John of Damascus. A couple more, grace, thesis, where sin abounded, grace did not, did much more abound. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Quote, whosoever abideth in him, Christ sinneth not. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Thesis, right? Antithesis, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. On faith, thesis is free. Faith is free and depends on the free will of man. Antithesis is God's gift and is not found in human will, but in the will of the Father, who draws us to Christ. Finally, the coming of Christ. Thesis, to judge the world. Quote, for judgment, I come into the world. Antithesis, not to judge the world. Quote, I came not to judge the world. Those last two were from John 9, 39 and John 12, 47. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next time.